What's going on guys, AFK Tech here, and today we're going to be taking a look at setting up a Plux server as well as a Plux client. So the first question you might have is why do you want to have Plex? What's, what's this good for? Well Plex is a way to serve up your movies, TV shows, music, fo photos and videos, and a few other features that they're working on. Best of all, it allows you to access your media on a multitude of different devices across many different ecosystems from an Xbox 360 to an Xbox One to an Apple TV and so much more. So let's get started on what you need to set up a server, how to do it, and a client that I use via the Raspberry Pi. So the first thing you're gonna need is the server itself. So for this project, I'm using my TS140, my Lenovo Think server. So I did a video review on this before, and it's rocking a pretty beefy setup for a Plex server in general. It's got an E3 1225 V4, I believe, um, quad-core Xeon processor with four gigs of RAM and then two four terabyte Seagate NAS drives. So the most important things to think about when thinking about setting up a Plex server itself is the CPU and then storage. So for the CPU, Plex recommends around 2,000 to 2,500 um, pass mark points per 1080p transcode that you plan to send. For me, I have around 10,000 pass mark, um, so I could hypothetically support up to four 1080p streams. Something to think about here in the future though is as 4K becomes more prevalent and as Plex begins to bring up more and more 4K support as it already has on a few different clients, um, you might need to have a little bit beefier processor or something that has HEVC or X265 codec support built into it, the processor instruction sets itself. As for RAM, I have four gigs of ECC. This uh, Plex server does not take up any RAM at all. I think at idle I've seen it sitting around 25 and the max I've ever seen it using is around 100 megabytes. Um, so on other note is the storage. So this is where most of your stuff is gonna be. So if you have a lot of movie files and you're a really high quality movie guru, you wanna get these 10 gig files, you're gonna rack up a lot of storage space. So I have these two four terabytes mirrored in RAID 1. Um, and this allows me because I don't wanna lose this stuff. It's not necessarily critical, personal, important data. Um, I, don't have any, I don't have a lot of files stored on this or anything. Um, and this is just media but I don't want to have to re-download this or grab it off of Blu-rays that I have or anything like that. So I just think it's easier to do a RAID 1 setup just to protect yourself from having that hassle. The other star of the show, the client itself, is this Raspberry Pi 3. What we're going to be doing is putting on an open source operating system called Rasplex that allows us to turn this Raspberry Pi into a Plex Media Server client. So through the use of the HDMI port that we have here and the Ethernet jack that we have here, we're gonna have a full-fledged client, as well as if you wanna use Wi-Fi that's built into this Raspberry Pi 3 in order to access your movies, your TV shows, and music that you put on your new Plex server. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started on setting the server up itself. So the first step is gonna be navigating to Plex's website. I'll link that down in the video description. And on the homepage, you're gonna see some of their features and kind of just advertising about the servers in general. You can see all the different ecosystems that they are on, Chromecast, Xbox, PS4, Nvidia Shield, Apple TV, anything you can think of has a Plex app. Even my Sony uh, Smart TV has it as well. So we're gonna go ahead and go to Downloads. Uh, the main download that most people are getting is the Plex Media Server itself. But there's also some cool apps for your desktop you can check out, such as Plex Home Theater, um, that allow you to actually stream directly to the desktop in its own app. And it's a really cool feature because it gives you such a movie theater feel. Um, HTPC would be a great place to be using that. So let's go ahead and download this. So we can see all the different platforms that they support from Windows to FreeBSD, as well as some of the embedded NASes. They all have their own um, Plex, as well as a Docker container here that you can grab uh, to set it up pretty easily with Docker. Um, here we go with grabbing Windows, because I already did a Linux install. I think Windows is the easiest for this stuff, especially if you just can spin up a VM and give it a couple cores, uh, if you're not gonna be using a lot of streams at the same time, and then pass it through some sort of storage um, space. Um, but so we're going to go ahead and do Windows today. So we're going to go ahead and download it. I already downloaded it and then we're going to remote it into our Windows machine. So this could be a Windows 10 box. It doesn't have to be Windows Server 2012 like I'm running. Um, I get these keys free through, free through school so that's not a big deal for me. But if you're just going to be running a Windows 10 it's not a big deal. The big thing to think about is how you're going to be able to keep it accessible 24-7. That way you can get it on the go and wherever you're at. So let's go ahead and get into this. So we pasted this onto the desktop here and we're gonna go ahead and run it. So for options, it's gonna allow you to select where you wanna install it, nothing fancy. We're just gonna keep it as default program x86 area. 
and then it's going to install it. So it's pretty straightforward install, nothing uh, big going on here. So once the computer restarts, you're going to see that the Plex Media Server is now running in the background. You also have a taskbar icon down here, which gives you a couple of options. You can check for updates, uh, see what version you're on, update your libraries, etc. We're going to go ahead and open Plex up. So this is going to open up a web browser and navigate to the GUI for the server. So as you see, this sign up page or sign in page came up. For now, we're going to ignore this by hitting back. It's going to just take us to the dashboard of the Plex server itself. So you have your server name, which is most likely going to be your host name for, or your computer name that you have it installed on. And then we have some other settings here. So we have no libraries yet. Um, so we're first going to go through the settings and just talk about some of the things that we need to set up. So I would recommend actually making an account. Um, this will allow you to access things not via IP address. So it, it'll constantly be updating the IP to the Plex servers itself. And whenever you navigate to Plex, it'll just take you to your server. Um, so we got a couple other settings here. We're going to turn on show advanced uh, application data here. Don't worry about that. Uh, you can change your name. Let's say we want to call this first Plex server. We can go ahead and do that. Uh, check for updates here. Um, a lot of other little debugging stuff. Um, we're on the public update channel. We don't need to be anything higher than that. So we'll save the changes. I definitely say make sure you create an account here. Um, next step is going to be actually getting this accessible from the outside network. So this is where you do want to create an account. Um, that's first step, as well as making sure you're forwarding your 32400 port to this um, Plex server, the IP that the server is actually running on. That'll allow you to access it outside of your current network. Um, outside of that, we have some agents. So this is what actually gathers database information. So if you add a new media file, um, it'll you know deduce what media file it is, get album artwork or DVD cover page, whatever. Um, information, all that fun stuff. Um, for library, I like to set this up um, a little bit differently. So I would like to update my library automatically. Um, I like to scan. I like it to be updated because if I add a new file in, I don't want to have to come into the web UI and manually update the uh, Plex server itself because that's just kind of a pain. I want it to be there on demand the second it gets added to the server. Um, so we do want to, I'm going to allow media deletion as well if I want to purge out some stuff. Um, and then this on deck, so this is kind of considers like, you know, new things you added in uh, <clears throat> and shows you, you know, what you haven't watched yet. Um, I'm not going to mess with that. Um, scanner task at a lower priority. So when you do scan through the files, uh, it does take a little bit of CPU up. So if you don't want it to be, you know, very uh, high priority on your server because you have other tasks running on this, you can check that off. Um, and then generate video preview thumbnails. I don't have that set up. So we're going to go ahead and save those changes. And changes have been saved. So then channels. Uh, this is an interesting thing you guys can jump into a little bit more. And then we have some networking stuff. So this is if you want to set up some HTTPS, um, things like that, and some other more custom networking stuff if you don't want uh, authentication on something. So like for this, I could put in my local uh, network and then I wouldn't have to actually log in with my username and password in order to connect to the server. It would just automatically take me to the GUI. i rather just keep the sign-in set up. That way you don't have people uh, you know, potentially getting into it. Um, for the transcoder, uh, this is an area that you might have to play around with. I like to make my CPU hurt because I'm dedicating some CPU to this Plex server itself. And then I keep this on very, very fast and then you can a limit how many transcodes you have. So let's say you have you know six users, but you only have a CPU for three. Rather than having those six users all have crappy streams, you could only allow three people to stream at once. Um, hopefully, if you're doing something that large scale, you did get powerful enough of a CPU. Uh, languages, some DNLA, DN, DLNA stuff. This is pretty nice. Um, this allows you to access some of this stuff on DNLA support devices such as Blu-ray players without having to get any Plex app or anything like that. It just allows you to directly stream. Um, you can schedule some tasks here. So this is when it does pretty much maintenance for everything. Um, so updating library, getting rid of stuff, purging stuff, all that fun stuff. Um, so then extras here. So these cinema trailers are pretty cool. Um, this is some of the Plex Plus features. So if you have movies you're starting up, it'll show you trailers for movies in your library you haven't watched yet, um, things like that, as well as if you're a Plex Pass uh, member, you can see cinema trailers for movies that are coming out um, very soon or in theaters even, which is honestly a really cool thing because you know you kick your movie on, runs through a couple cinema trailers, gets you time to get your popcorn, gets you set up, 
all that fun stuff. Um, it kind of seems silly, but it, it really is a nice feature. So we're going to go ahead and go home, and we're going to go ahead and add our first library. So let's say we're going to go ahead and do movies. So we're going to call it, just keep it called movies, and then we're going to add folders. So this is where you have the ability to actually set up where your folder is going to be. So for me, I only have a C drive, but if you have a D drive that's your RAID 1 setup or your extra space or your four terabytes of space, whatever, that's where you're going to want to build out your Plex library itself from a file perspective. Um, I like to set up a general file um, folder called Plex, and then inside that I drill down into the specifics such as movies, TV shows, and music. So we're just going to go ahead and add the default videos um, thing here just for you know just because there's no really any big deal here there's not going to be anything in there but you guys get the idea of how that works and then once you get that set up you can do some other little things with it um, you can you know test out what scanner you wanted to use what agent where you wanted to get its data from and some of the other cool stuff such as rod tomato integration and things like that um, so that's all I got for the setup of the server itself. Um, I have a server set up. I wasn't going to run you guys through that. I wanted to show you guys, you know, exactly what steps you need to take to do that. So let's jump over to actually setting up this Razplex client that um, I use on a regular basis to watch movies from my Plex server. So setting up the client is pretty straightforward as well. Um, so you need your Raspberry Pi 3, as I mentioned before, um, a way to connect to the network with it, which will preferably be wired, as well as getting a micro SD card, at least eight gigabytes. That's what I have for sure. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and go to the Razplex website. So these guys are really cool. Uh, this is an open source project um, that's really was just you know spun up to create the make the Raspberry Pi a cool client for um, Plex server itself. So we're gonna go ahead and get Razplex here. Be sure to donate to these guys if you uh, really do love this. This is definitely something to check out. Um, so here's the installer. So what this is going to do is actually install the operating system onto the SD card uh, that you are going to then put into your Raspberry Pi. So if you're running on Windows, get Windows, so on and so forth. I'm going to go ahead and grab the Windows version because obviously I'm on Windows right now. So we'll go ahead and save that. Um, so it'll tell you some of the information that you have. So it does support all the way down to the Model B, Model B+, B2, and then Pi 3 and Pi 0. I recommend getting the Pi 3, as I said before, because it is a little bit beefier. I do have a case for a Raspberry Pi, and as you see here, you only need at least a 4 gigabyte Class 10 SD card um, in order to run this itself. Um, so we're going to go ahead and open up that installer. So this is actually a pretty cool installer. It makes it really easy to actually set this up. So we have a Raspberry Pi. Um, so I would go ahead and put the Pi 2, um, even though the Pi 3 isn't on here. Um, and then we'll do 1.71, and then it'll download the image here. So we'll select an image file. Um, so we'll click download, and this will give you the target on where you wanted to put it. So we'll put it on the desktop. And then we'll let it download, so it's downloading the file. And then you'll have your SD card inside your card reader, and then you'll write to the SD card. So you'll let that work. It's pretty straightforward. I'm not going to rewrite mine because I don't see any reason to because I have some settings set up. And then you're going to go ahead and put the SD card into the Raspberry Pi itself. And then we will go ahead and hook it up to the TV and get it set up. Once you get the Razplex image installed on the SD card, you reinsert it back into the Raspberry Pi and go ahead and hook it up to your TV. A um, couple things to note is you want to make sure you have your TV on and on the right input source before you do this. That way you can scale the screen size without any issues, as well as making sure that you are connected to your internet um, via the LAN jack if you have an Ethernet cable nearby, or you can set up your Wi-Fi here in this step. So we're going to go ahead and get started on the actual setup. So the cool thing about the smart TVs is most of them now allow you to control devices via HDMI connection. Um, so this remote for my TV actually allows me to control the Razplex. So it makes it really easy to set up. Don't have to get a keyboard and a monitor to get things going. So as you can see, uh, the top option is that wired because I already have my Razplex plugged in. So we're going to go ahead and hit next. If you were going to select a Wi-Fi network, you could do so here and connect to one and do, do it that way. But obviously, I'd recommend sticking with a um, LAN connection if possible. So now on the next part, we're going to calibrate the screen. I'm not going to because I don't see any issue with mine. Uh, if it looks like it's scaled right, most likely it's OK. You can always come back to adjust this setting later. Next is signing into Plex itself. So as I mentioned earlier, you should probably create an account. It'll allow you to access things a lot easier. 
And that's the way I would do it with this as well, because when you can do it on these devices, if you use sign into Plex here, all you do is you get a pin and then you log into your account on your desktop and you just have to enter this four digit pin instead of using your clunky TV remote in order to enter your password and email address and all that fun stuff. So for now, we don't have any servers connected because I haven't signed in. I'm gonna go ahead and sign in to my actual Plex server, not the one we just set up, where I actually already have some media set up and show you guys what all is on it. So here we are on my Plex server, me and my roommate's Plex server homepage. So as you can see, we have a few different categories here. Um, we have books, so these are audio books that we have. Um, FLAC, so it's our lossless audio. Uh, movies, so these are our general movies, old music. This is old, old music that I had laying around. Uh, favorite TV shows that we watch, torrents, so that's the stuff that's just now coming in. And then you have channels features, which is built into Plex to begin with. So as you can see, it's pretty straightforward and well laid out. The nicest thing about this Razplex client is the fact that it's so easy to use. The fact that you can use your TV remote to navigate through this is very critical, especially if you're setting this up for someone who's not super um, technology adept and they just want something that works. You can just sit down, this can always be running in the background, you can tune to this input and you'll be all set. Not only can you access all these different things here on this, you actually have a lot of different settings you can access regarding TV, so if you have a TV that supports uh, 24p in order to get a more cinematic picture uh, you can set that kind of thing up you got DTS pass-through Dolby Digital DTS HD all that fun stuff you get direct play so you, if you don't even want to transcode if you want to pull that file directly how it is um, to the Rasplex you can do that no problem um, overall this is really just what I wanted to show you guys I didn't want to get too in-depth with it because I didn't want this video to be crazy long and if you have any more questions, be sure to leave a comment down below. Give me a thumbs up if you liked the video. If you disliked it, give me a thumbs down. Let me know why down in the comments. Um, be sure to jump on my Amazon link down there in the description. That helps me out a ton. I get a kickback on whatever you guys purchase on Amazon. Make sure you bookmark it if you can. This is AFK Tech signing off.